be in the house of the Lord, a place where we can lift up the name of Jesus, and the Bible says that Jesus is right there in our midst. Praise God. We've been, uh, we spent last weekend up in Washington, D.C., and I'm not going to spend very much time talking about Washington, D.C., but we went up there as a company of his people yeah. to begin to return and to repent for the sin, our sins and the sins of our nation. Praise God. And you know, God's got some promises to those who will return to him. I want to read 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. This was kind of the theme of the return that we went to up in Washington, D.C. I'm going to start with verse 13, though. It says, when I shut up heaven and earth, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. Sounds a lot like the United States and the world right now. When that pestilence comes among my people, if my people, oh, praise God, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, listen to this, then I will hear from heaven. Praise God. He will hear us and he'll forgive our sin and heal the land. Praise God. God's calling the church. Praise God. The church has got a special place in God today. We are the ones that can make a difference. We can come back to him and repent of our sins. But listen to this. We can return to the Lord. You know, he said, if you seek me, you will find me. And if you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. I want to find Jesus today. I want to find the Lord. How about you? I want to stand in his presence. He said if two or three today will come 
and worship me and praise me, he said, I will be right there in the midst. Praise God. Can we be the church today? Can we be the ones that seek God, that enter into his presence today? And Jesus says, I will be right there with that church. I will be there right there with that people today. And I will heal First, he'll forgive us our sins, but I will heal the land. And that word heal means to cure, to repair, to mend, and to restore the health of the land. That's what God wants to do. And he wants to do it through his church. If we will return to him and repent of our sins, God will hear and forgive and to heal the land. Praise God. I'm looking forward to the Lord. I just want to... I brought out my notebook here purposely because I wanted to share a prophecy that I shared with uh, the Thursday night prayer group. Praise God. Not all of it because it would take a little too long, but listen to this. Save me a little time, brother. Save it a little bit. <laughs> Praise God. God says that I am bringing an exposure of glory. Oh, glory. A fresh explosion of my glory to the church. That brings them from worshiping people to worshiping me. Here at today, church, we don't need to look to a man. We don't need to look to a government, but we need to look to the Lord and worship him today. Listen to what he said. When they worship me with the fullness of their body and soul, press, push through the veil that has already been torn. You hear that, brother? The veil has already been torn. Push through the veil. That's already been torn to reach the fullness of my glory and my power. Praise God so I can move in and through you. Yes. Praise God. I'm excited about what the Lord's about to do. The prophets all speak of it. They speak of God's glory falling upon the land. But we've got to go through that time of repentance. That time of return to the Lord. How many of y'all want to see something from God? We need a move from God. We need the fresh glory of God. The exposure to what God is doing in the land. Let's enter in today and let God move in our hearts. Welcome God into our hearts and let God have his way. Lord, Lord, we welcome you this morning. We want to welcome you into this place, Lord. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you our hearts, Lord. We submit unto you and commit our lives to you and ask that you would have your way in this service, in our hearts today. Help us to fully return unto you and give you all the glory and the honor. We welcome you in this service today. In Jesus' name, praise God. Let's welcome God in. Yes, Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Daughter of Zion, lift up your voice. Hold on to your peace. Praise Him. Praise Him, daughter of Zion. Daughter of Zion, lift up your voice. Hold on to peace, praise him, the king of all of the kings, the God of all God, he is in the king, glory to his name. He is the king of all of the kings. He is the God of all God. He is the name. Glory to his name. Oh, daughter of Zion, lift up your voice. Hold on to your peace. Praise him. Praise him, daughter of Zion. Lord, I am with you, fear not. 
He says to us, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. And that was Paul. He was the one that was saying that. He said, there's this thorn in my flesh. That the, he's the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Praise God. But he's also the same one, brother, that said, he said, God gives us the victory. God always causes us to triumph in Christ. Praise God. I want you to know, you may not feel it today. But God is still on the throne. God is still able. And God has still got victory for the church today. Praise God. Somebody give him glory today. When we give him glory, God, the feeling might come. The feeling of victory will come into the midst today. Praise God. I want you to know today if we will worship him, the presence of God comes in. God's presence, his victory. His spirit comes in our midst today. We just need to learn to lift God up. And we may not feel it when we walk into the church, but by the time we leave, we're going to know the presence of God. We're going to feel the victory of God in our hearts and lives. Praise God. How many of y'all love God today? Praise God. I just want to worship and glorify Him, giving Him the honor and the glory. Oh, you are worthy, worthy. Praise God. We're going to take up an offering today, but let's continue to lift up the Lord. Lord, whatever's going on outside these doors and these walls today does not have to affect us, bro. Amen. Praise God. Whatever's going on out there, Jesus is with us. He said, I will never leave you, brother. I will never forsake you. Jesus is with us. 
as we walk out those doors today, Jesus is going with us. And he will never leave us and forsake us. Lord God, we just thank you today for your presence in this place. God, we thank you, Lord, that you reach out to us when we don't feel like it sometimes. Help us, Lord, to lift up your name, to lift you and give you glory. And Lord, that you would inhabit our praises. We ask your blessing on this offering, that you would use it to your glory. Use it to your work, oh God. And we give it to you with glory, honor, and thanksgiving for your blessings upon us. We praise you today. Lift up your name. And give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. By the authority of the Holy Ghost, we take dominion today over the powers of darkness that have ruled over our nation, and we command them to be broken in the name of Jesus. For this is the hour of the church, says the Lord, and not the hour of man. And by the end of this year, says God, the greatest outpouring that you've ever seen is going to hit the United States of America. Starting January 20. In this year, hallelujah, God is going to begin to declare that there is a release of an unprecedented move of the Holy Ghost like we've never seen in our lifetime. Thus saith God, I'm coming after the strongholds that have ruled over this nation for decades, and I am pulling them down by the power of the Spirit of God. For the violence that you see in the land and the roaring that you hear over our nation is demon spirits that are crying out because the angels of the Lord have come to silence them for this hour. And just as the world has put a mask on the church and just as the world has put a muzzle on the people of God, the spirit of intimidation that has risen against the church, I, the Lord thy God, now I'm going to take that spirit and I'm going to put it on the world 
up and the heavens that have been brass says the Lord I'm breaking up by the power of the Holy Ghost for four years say it God from night to for 2021 through 2024 this is the last final harvest say it God that is going to hit this church no demon will be able to stop the glory of the Lord that's coming up get ready says the Lord for the holiness of God is coming up in this hour and I the Lord thy God will take no back seat to a man for what I'm getting ready to do says the Lord will not be known by personality or name but it will be known by the power of the Holy Ghost I'm going to pull down strongholds over this nation sports will not recover though they say they will theaters are going to remain empty saith God and the church is going to begin to fill up and the glitter of sin that has drawn the sinner to the world is now going to be tarnished and I'm going to cause the church saith the Lord to rise to her feet there is a roar of the line of Judah saith God I'm going to release divine healing upon the nation I am also coming after a generation of young people that have never been in church never known God I'm going to invade the homosexual community and I'm going to set them free by the power of the Holy Ghost there is anointing saith the Lord that I am releasing over this nation just as the laws have come out of this city in the natural saith God so now is there a law being released out of heaven that says my church will not be silent for though I am raising up hallelujah mighty men for the spirit of Jezebel has ruled over this nation for a century but I have raised up an Elijah anointing saith God that's gonna break the spirit of Jezebel and there's gonna be peace in the land there's gonna be silence amongst the liberals saith the Lord and I'm gonna put a roar in the mouth of my people even to the age of young five and six year olds the glory of God is getting ready to come down upon this nation give a shout saith the Lord for I have not forgotten thee I will never leave thee I will never forsake thee in 1906 William Seymour said this there is another revival coming up about a hundred years and it the bloodline is gonna cross the color line here God today this is not about color this is not about culture this is about the church and God said the church is my body so today I release healing into you I release a spirit of boldness upon you yet come against the spirit rise up saith God whatever you bind I'll bind whatever you loose I'll loose for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world there is a liberty saith the Lord I am releasing over this land and it is a harvest of souls your churches are going to fill up your children are going to praise the Lord your bodies are going to be healed because I declare it saith God and it shall be done saith God Brother, brother Scott, I was hearing myself so well, I thought everybody else could. <laughs> <laughs> I heard <laughs> <you>. <laughs> 
They had this big 12 by 20 foot monitor there. It looked like I was right up by the stage. And different ones had been praying. And when Brother Christmas stood up to pray, he started to pray. And then a mighty anointing that he fell. You could tell while he was speaking. He was under quite an unction, couldn't you? I'm going to tell you what, it fell over the whole crowd. And I heard what he was saying, and those words resonated in my heart. Do you understand, this was not one of those prophecies that are so general, they apply to lots of situations. This one got pretty specific. He said it's coming the first of the year, and it's going to go for four years. Pray God. And it's going to be the greatest revival the world has ever seen. The prophet Joel declared, in the last day saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters, on your servants and your handmaids, and your young men will dream dreams. No, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Is that what it was? I think it goes both ways. Some old people are getting some visions too. Amen. It's not too late to get a vision. Don't say I'm too old. No, you're not. There's a revival coming. Praise God. Praise God. And in the nomenclature of the Jewish culture, the former rain was the first rain before the plant. The latter rain was the last rain before the harvest. He said in Joel there, he said, I will pour out the former rain, and then I will pour out the latter rain abundantly. Now, do you ever go window shopping in the book of Acts? You know, like somebody going to the big department store, and they got that display there, and they get the tree. Face right up there against the window, you know, say, like, Ooh, I'd like one of those, and I wish I had one of these, and mm, a couple of those would be nice too. And then you just walk away and say, Yeah, but I can't afford that. Huh? Sometimes we go window shopping in the book of Acts. Oh, I like some of those healing. I like some of those manifestations. Oh, but that was in the early church. It's time to stop window shopping. And yes. start living the book of Acts. Yes. And according to the prophet, this is going to be a greater revival than the book of Acts revival. Right. Can you even imagine something greater? I'm thinking of the passage that tells us Peter was walking down the street and the healing was in such abundance that when his shadow would pass yes. over people, they would get healed. Right. You think Peter could heal everybody like that? No. How come they were getting healed? The Holy Spirit was doing it. Amen. And he hasn't run out of power. Do you realize that today? God has not run out of power. Praise God. And he said this will be the greatest revival ever. That sounds like the latter rain. He called it the last revival. Wow, that could mean the coming of the Lord is right here, folks. Would you say it's time to get ready to go? Amen. It is time to be ready to go. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank God. Today, it's the first Sunday of the month, and around here we try to observe communion on the first Sunday of each month. And uh, somebody said, how often is appropriate to observe communion. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us how often to do it. It seems to me if you do it too frequently, it loses some of its solemnity and its significance. But if you do it too infrequently, you lose the power and the blessing right. of that experience. So, in our trade-off, we try to do it every month. 
You know, some churches just do it on New Year's and Easter or something like that. Uh, Christmas. I think it should be a little more often than that. As a matter of fact, when I read the book of Acts, there, it looks to me like the early church was doing it every day. They're getting together with each other every time they get together. Let's say, let's show the Lord's death. Jesus, over there in the book of Mark, it tells us, That uh, verse 23 after, uh, let's start with Mark 14, verse 22. As they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Now, apparently they were sharing from a single goblet. Under the circumstances of the world we're living in today, and particularly right now at this time, we don't think it's appropriate for us to pass a single cup around and ask everybody to drink out of it. But uh, over the book of Matthew, it says, He took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and said, Drink ye all of it. And somebody said that means you're supposed to drink it all. Well, which one gets to drink it all if you're passing around a cup? If the first one drinks it all, everybody else misses out. <laughs> Now, what I think it's trying to tell us is that everybody took a drink of it. Everybody participated. And then he told what the significance of this action is. It's to show the Lord's death to be come. The point of the communion is for us to remember that what it's all about is that Jesus gave his life for our salvation. He allowed his body to be brutalized. Sometimes we see these pictures or statues of Jesus on the cross. You can tell right away, you know, it's, it's a pretty sad sight. He's got the crown of thorns on his head, and you can see the blood running down, and arms are stretched out, but he's nice and clean. That's not what he looked on the cross. The scripture said he was so badly brutalized that he didn't even look like a human. His body was broken for us. He said, when you eat this bread, remember my body which was broken for you. And when you drink this cup, remember my blood that was shed for your redemption. When Jesus died on the cross, he died as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You understand the foundation of the world is not when the earth was created. It was when the kingdom of darkness was created. What's the scripture talking about when it says the God of this world has blinded their eyes? Not the God of the earth. As a matter of fact, the earth does not belong to Satan anymore. Somebody said, no, the earth belonged to God. Well, it did, but in Psalms it says, the heavens he's reserved to himself, the earth he has given to man. The God of this world is the force of darkness in the kingdom of darkness. The God of this world is Satan. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It doesn't mean you can't like anything on earth. No. I don't think you should use the term love for pizza. I love pizza. 
Folks, love is supposed to be for God. Don't love pizza, but you can like it. Yeah. You can oh, like it a lot, certain kind. My wife's a little picky on the pizza. Some pizza I can bring it home. She's so like, oh, that's junk. I said, well, but it's pretty good junk food. Let's eat it. <laughs> Got lots of cheese in <laughs> But we're not going to love pizza. We're going to love God. But when the scripture said, love not the things of the world, it's not talking about pizza or a new car. It's talking about the things of darkness. Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When the kingdom of darkness was created, God said, I'm going to send a redeemer. I'm going to go in the flesh and redeem man to myself. But when he came out of the tomb, he did not come out the lamb. He came out our eternal high priest. And he reigns forever and ever. He declared, I am he that was and was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. And all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. He declared, in the end, I'm going to be the one that does the judging. It's going to be Jesus. But you remember the story when early in the morning before daylight, Mary went out to the tomb and it was already empty. And she was devastated, thinking they've taken his body to disgrace him. She fell to the ground and was just weeping. And she heard some guy say, woman, why are you crying? She thought it was the gardener. You'd think she recognized Jesus' voice and been around him a lot. Except she couldn't imagine that it could be Jesus. Well, he sounded a little, well, he, he must be from Galilee too. He's got that same accent they do up there. Anybody ever notice that people from Boston can't say an R unless it's not there? <laughs> Like a pillow is a pillow, <laughs> but a car is a car. <laughs> you can tell they're from Boston, yeah. right? Yeah. Sounds like he's from Galilee. He must be from Jesus area. He said, hey, tell me where he is. <laughs> and then Jesus spoke her name. Yes. Oh, he said, yeah. Mary. Oh, when Jesus speaks your name, yes. you would have to ask somebody, was that God? Right. Oh, you'll know you've heard from heaven when Jesus calls your name. The Apostle Paul, when his name was still Saul, and he was persecuting the church, and the Lord knocked him to the ground with a great light and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He wasn't sure who he's talking to, but he knew it was the Lord, and he said, Who are you, Lord? When Jesus calls your name, You'll know you've heard from God. And she said, Ramona. And she reached out to kiss his feet and he pulled back. No, no, no. You can't touch me. Well, that's a fine how to do it. I'm here crying about you and loving you and missing you. And I find you and you're like, get back. Don't touch me. What's the matter with you? That doesn't make me feel very warm, Jesus. I feel a little bit rejected right now. No, she didn't go through that. He explained. He said, no, 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 you can't touch me. Because I have to ascend to my father. What was going on there? Well, you see, in the tabernacle plan, after the lamb was sacrificed, the priest had to take the blood and go into the tabernacle. Past all the articles of furniture in the holy place. Over there was the golden candlesticks. And over here was the table of showbread. And right in front of him was the altar of incense. And he went past, sprinkled some of the blood on all of those. And then he went past the veil and into the holiest of holies. And there on the Ark of the Covenant 
was that plate that was called the mercy seat, directly under the outstretched wings of the cherubim. And there he put the blood of the sacrifice, and the fire of God would come down from heaven and accept the sacrifice, and their sins will roll forward for another year. But Jesus, after he was the sacrifice, had to take the blood that was shed, not into the temple, but to the eternal mercy seat in the heavens at the throne of God. And there he took the blood as our eternal high priest and put it on the altar before God. And there his blood was accepted as the price for our sin. Later we see him really couldn't be touched was because once the priest had washed himself in the brass labor. And the Bible said that was the type of his burial. Even today, the water baptism is the type of his burial. It is the New Testament token of the covenant. Somebody said, well, baptism, you can take it or leave it. It's just an outward sign of an inward cleansing. It's actually a part of the plan. It's the token of the covenant. Jesus was buried, and we are buried with him in baptism. But when he came out, he was cleansed by the burial, and now he had to take the blood to the mercy seat and could not touch anything that hadn't been sanctified. He couldn't touch anything dead, and because Mary had not been sanctified, she could not touch him. Later, we find him on the beach cooking dead fish, and he's touching the fish and saying, come on over, have the blood. We see him talking. We see him telling Thomas, come on, put your hand in my side. He could be touched now. Why? Because he had been to the eternal mercy seat, put the blood there, and the blood was accepted, and now he was seen of people for 40 days. At one time, over 500 at once. But people all over the area got to see him alive. It was not something done in a corner that uh, uh, some clever writer wrote a book about. Let me tell you. It was a well-known fact yes. that Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. And the blood that he shed is the redemptive covenant for our salvation. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us of sin. And that is why today we partake of this communion to honor the Lord. Brother Daniel, would you help me? Brother Mark, would you mind me helping you? I'd like I said, serve everyone. Now, some people think you should only partake of communion if you're a member of a church. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ as a son of God, and you believe in the redemption, just go ahead, brother. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're a believer in the blood of Jesus Christ, you need to show his death till he comes. It's not a matter of being a member of our church. It's a matter of being a member of the family of believers. And so you don't have to belong to this church to belong to God. I know there are some people that think God gives out franchises for his salvation. And, you know, there's some churches like, we got the franchise for this area. If you don't come through our church, you can't get to heaven. I've known a few Pentecostals who were that way. Somebody said, this fellow died and went to heaven, and he was getting a tour of the, uh, of the land of glory. Peter was taking him around, and when they were all done, he said, uh, this has been most interesting. But over there in the middle, there was this section uh, with the really high walls, and you could hear a lot of noise over in there, uh, but we didn't go in there. What is that? He said, oh, shh, that's the Pentecostals. They think they're the only ones up here. You understand? Nobody gets to have a franchise on the kingdom of God. They don't have to come through you to get to God. They come to Jesus. The only way is Jesus Christ. Praise God. Thank you.
And the Royal County preacher. <laughs> On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. And when he had broken it, he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, we lift up this cup. Representing your blood, which was shed for us. To give us a redemption from sin. Not just a moment of feeling better, but complete, total, wiping away our sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. We bless this cup and thank you for shedding your blood for our salvation. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Sammy is going to come and collect the cups. Let us just raise a hand to heaven and say, Oh Lord. Oh Lord, I thank you for this. For giving your heart, for shedding your heart. Today, we show your death till you come. In Jesus' name. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. I want to say it's good to see all of you that are here. God bless you. Sister Pam is going to come and lead us in prayer for the church group. Every week we pray for a, another church in this valley and ask God's blessing on you. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Yeah, I feel him. He has touched me this morning. I'm so thankful for the way he takes care of us. And sometimes we just chafe at his taking care of us. It's really amazing to me the way that his ways are higher than ours. And if we'll just rest in him, he has the answers that we need. Thank you, Lord. I'm thankful. I celebrate every lighthouse in this valley that lifts up the name of Jesus. Amen. And today we're going to pray for a church that I always thought their nickname was just kind of a snarky thing that the community gave them, but guess what? It's on their website, so they must love it. They, we call them the Copper Top Church. They are easy to spot. St. Saint Saint Paul's United Methodist Church. There are some precious, precious people that are members of that congregation. One of the things that I like to do when I'm getting ready to pray for a church is to look and see what they say about themselves. Because sometimes you can learn a lot by that. And here's the scripture that they have posted prominently on their Facebook page. It's Romans 15, 1 through 7. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we can have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. So that with one heart and mouth, you may glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. O oh God, give us a heart for those who are weaker than we are. 
for those without the revelation that we have. Lord, give us a heart for others the way that Jesus had a heart for others. Would you stand with me and let's pray for the ministry and the congregation of St. Paul's United Methodist Church. Heavenly Father, your word says that if your name be lifted up, you will draw all men to you. I thank you because in the confines of the building of St. Paul's Methodist Church, your name is lifted high every week. Lord, there's a ministry there that calls on you and asks you for direction and asks you for understanding. Lord, I ask that you pour understanding out on that ministry as they have never experienced it before. I ask that you pour revelation into their hearts, into their minds, and I ask that you give them a boldness to share that revelation with the congregation. Lord, the congregation that is filled with people who believe in your word, they believe in the power of who you are, Lord, I ask you to make yourself alive to them. Walk with them on a daily basis. Let them realize that you are by their side as they are considering the needs of those who are, who are hurting, who are weak, who are poor. Lord, let them understand that there's more than just natural things that those folks need to be given. But there is the power of your spirit. There is the glory of your presence. Oh, Lord, I ask you to pour the glory of your presence over that place. Let them, let them wonder at what their experience has been. Let them be in awe of the power that they feel when they lift your name on high. Oh, God, I ask you to fill that building all the way to its very high copper top with the power of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Scott is coming. Good morning. Good morning. If I remember our schedule right last week, we were just leaving the runway in Phoenix at this time last Sunday. It was one of those weekends I got back was like, this time we've been gone for like three weeks. <laughs> but that was because so much happened in the spirit that it was just like, it was all alone. There wasn't a, a physical thing that felt three weeks. It was a spiritual thing. So much. Happened. Um, I'll kind of go into some of it. The whole day, it was actually a pretty quick day, actually. If you think of a whole day of prayer, most people are like, oh, can we all day? <laughs> you kind of get tired. It was like three o'clock before we realized it. I was like, what? Where did the day go? The cool thing is, uh, it's like, I thought we were like, where are we going to be late? Where are we going to find it? Place when we get there, we'll find a place to, to sit or stand or whatever we're going to do. And it had rained all Saturday. And it's on Friday. Uh, I'm sorry. And on Saturday, we got there and it quit raining sometime overnight. It was actually still raining when we got up. By the time we got there, it quit raining. And all we got was maybe a few drops here and there all day. So that was that also a dark thing. When we got there, we rode the, the metro in. I was like, man, we're going to be, they're going to be starting. And we walked out of this, this uh, metro station right by that stream. And I was like, well, there's really nowhere to go but here, so okay. So we went right up front. It's like, oh, that was a bad thing, too. But the whole day was just incredible. Um, actually, what I started getting in, I started actually on Thursday. I think it was Thursday. I was on the way to work 
and I had um, turned on the car and Caleb says the one, first thing comes out of the speaker, not in the middle of a word, not in the middle of the statement, just pray this today. Here I am, Lord, send me. And I knew at that moment, I was like, okay, the God, this this is this was not an accident. That was, there was no, because sometimes you turn on the radio and you hear things like that. It's like maybe it starts in the middle of the word. This was right there. It's like this was, God, you ordained this whole thing. It's like, okay, that was the command. And then it was like God was saying, okay, open your spiritual ears. And this is a word for everybody to open your spiritual ears because you don't know when or how I will speak. I can speak through anything. Don't limit how I can speak. Don't limit. It's not, yes, I will speak in the storm, still small ways, but I can use other ways too. He used the donkey. If he can use the donkey, he can speak through anything. That was an example of that. The radio. And on the way there on the plane, I was reading the Harbinger. It's been sitting in my shelf for a long time. And I was like, I said, read it now. Which is a good thing because what I had read, he referred to, Jonathan Cowan referred to, enough that I made him a meaning point. But while I was reading that, there was a section in there between there's a prophet in the book and then there's a, the uh, the journalist guy that is the main character. He's telling the story. They're having a talk. The prophet tells the journalist at one point, because the journalist went and did some research, and the prophet tells him, you're going, you're going deeper. That's good. Meaning what the prophet had told him. But that was, again, God speaking to me. It was an encouragement of, I see where you're going, and that's good. Right. And that day, it was confirmed twice. In the middle of one of the um, it was Jonathan Cullen. He had a, a time of repentance after his sermon. And, and he said, God may be calling some of you deeper. I was like, yes. And then that it, later that afternoon, on the way back on the metro, we were sitting there, and there's, there's this young man sitting not too far away. I was like, is that Joseph? Joseph? Baca was a young man who was in the youth group here when we were at Harvard World. And he moved to the East Coast because he got a job as an engineer. It's like, is, no, that can't be him. So finally, I just I watched him, his mannerisms, and I, I actually heard him talk about, oh, that's got to be him. So like, Joseph happened to be him. There's two things here how God, God spoke. One, uh, so you always wonder when, when you do ministry, especially with young kids, and then they move off, and it's like, did what we did teach them, and the ministry that you did with them, did it stick? We were talking with him. He had his girlfriend with him. His girlfriend is an amazing Christian young man. I was like, well, that's a good thing. And then he said, oh, by the way, I'm leaving in for two years to go to the Middle East in January. For a mission trip, I was like, "Well, apparently everything's done." So that was a, it was a good encouragement. But at the end of that, he said, "Let me pray for you guys." We got off the train, and before we left the station, he prayed over us. And in the middle of that prayer, he said, "God, I ask that you to take these men deeper." I was like, "Okay, God, that really was you." <laughs> But it didn't start there. It's like everywhere I look, and everywhere, not just looking, it's listening. It's, I was, Monday, I was just counting the change in the car after I got off work. And I looked, it's like, look, there's, there's a Mexican flag in there. I took that, I was like, wait, that's English on there. It was a 1904 Indian head penny. They're almost wow. in perfect condition. Wow. My first thought was, like, how in the world did that get to banks and people's hands and businesses without somebody scanning this? How? Like, well, there's only two answers for that. Number one, God blinded their eyes, or God Himself did it there, because God was speaking through that pen. It was, and every time I pick it up, it's like. 
it's like a reminder, and that's still kind of I want to talk a little bit more. So even things like that that I can speak to. And one last one, and this is um, we were watching on YouTube as a symphony orchestra doing Beethoven's Ninth yesterday. And we're watching it, it was really good. It was full, full orchestra, full chorus, soloists, and everything. And I started looking, I was like, you know what? There's young people there, like right out of college, young. And probably in the choir, there could have been some maybe high school kids. There was old people there, but every ethnicity you can think of was in that choir and orchestra. And then I said, like, you know, and then the Holy Spirit gave me this picture. See, all ages, all ethnicities, some people had a bigger job than others, like the soloists. Their names was on that program, but for most of the program, they sat there. They didn't really do much, but their name was front and center on that program. People came just to hear them, but they had a very, very small part. Some of the section leaders, the first violinist or the concert master, always like a world-class violinist. Some of the other ones, big names, their names were in the program, but they all, every no matter what their job was, how big or little, they all took their direction from one. Who stood in front of them, who directed the whole thing in unity. And perfect harmony, it was it was amazing. And so, and at that moment, it's like almost that that is a picture of the way the church should be. Didn't matter what the color was, didn't matter the age, didn't matter the job, everybody from the smallest to the largest name took their direction from the conductor. That is the way the church should be. Amen. So, all I have to say, keep your spiritual ears open. God is wanting to speak to you. And when I say, not just ears, because all those examples of everyone was different. The radio, a book, a person, a coin, a video, all different ways that God spoke to every single one of them powerfully. So don't be surprised when God speaks to you in a way that's like, well, you never spoke to me that way before. Yep. Just be open. Keep your spiritual ears open. Which means keeping your eyes and ears and your feelings and your senses and everything open, expecting God to speak. Because He wants to speak to you. He wants to know you. He wants you to know Him. So keep yourself available and open. And don't just listen to what He says. Here's the key do what He says. Sometimes, if it's just an encouragement, take it. If it's instructions like, Write this today. Do it. Don't do it immediately. It's like, okay, I'll do it. You never know what God has in store for you. So keep those spiritual ears open. Okay. Operation Christmas Child. What month is it? When is Collection Week? November. November. Which means next month. Amen. So, really seriously next month? Yes, next month. So be listening for what God would have you get. Um, we still need some soccer balls for sure. Sit there and then there are personal hygiene things, um, soap, washcloths, uh, toys, especially surprise big what they would call wow gifts. Um, just whatever God would put on, put on your heart. There's a list back there. I need to update it because quite a bit is coming in the last couple weeks. So next week for sure, you can take the one I have. I have one left back there. So if you need, would like one, you can take that one. I'll update it. And I'll have a new one for next week. So just be listening to what God has to say. We've got like a little over a month to gather things before we have a packing party as a church. Okay. It's always fun. We get, get together. As we're packing, we're praying for the boxes, and then when we're done, we pray over the boxes as a group, and then before we turn them in as a church, we pray over them again, 
And the cool thing is, when we dropped them off, they grew a little bit. Those boxes are bathed in prayer before they get to the destination. So, just be open. Keep your spiritual open ears open for that too. The Operation World today. We are in the Philippines. This is the only Christian nation in Asia. The only one. All the other ones are Hindu, Buddhist, or Muslim. So, and that is all because the Spanish went there for a while and they brought um, Catholic, the Catholic faith. And then the Americans had them as a colony for a while, but now they're independent. But they're still 90, actually the number I heard yesterday was actually 95% Christian. So, they are still in need of, because just because your country is Christian and you go to church doesn't mean that your heart is right. It doesn't mean that things are all great with the economy and the government and all that. It just means that that's a fact. But God wants to invade this country. And... Even, I know it says 181 languages, but the primary language is actually English. So you could go there as a missionary, and most people would understand you. Most people there are bilingual, trilingual, no many languages. And it's a beautiful nation, but they're also a nation that gets ravaged by the volcanoes that are there and the hurricanes that come through. So, um, the church is growing, the church is getting stronger, the, the, they're actually sending missionaries, Phil, Phil, the Philippine church is sending missionaries throughout the world. So that tells you right there that the church was pretty healthy. But that doesn't mean they don't need revival. They still need a revelation of who Jesus really is, who God really is, and to, and to know him in a very powerful personal way. Watch this video and pray along with this young woman. Might take you a little bit to because she's praying in English, but she's got a Filipino accent. So but listen carefully, you'll get her accent. She's passionate about her country. She loves her country and wants God to be with her. So pray along with her as she prays for the Philippines. Blessed be the Lord God of the Philippines. Heavenly Father, you have bestowed upon us amazing favor and grace. You spared us nearly 500 years ago when you led Ferdinand Magellan's ship to our shores. Had they landed directly to their desired destination, we would now be like our neighboring countries who are not predominantly so-called Christian. As the only Christian nation in Asia, Bring us to a genuine faith in Christ. Let it be so that each and every Filipino will have a saving knowledge and relationship with you, O Lord. Release us from the curses brought about by worshiping idols. We repent, O Lord God, for we have been praying to images made by our own hands. Remove the scales from our eyes so that our people would see you as you are. Our people have been steeped in witchcraft and sorcery. We are superstitious and have adulterated Christianity with folk religion. Crush under your feet the work of the enemy in your beloved people. Expose and evict from the Philippines the evil spirits controlling the people who are practicing magic arts. As you did in Paul's time, do now in our days, O God. Perform extraordinary miracles. Cause your word to increase and prevail mightily in every Filipino, in every home, in every barangay, in every city, in every province, in every region. O Lord, 
our people are scattered all over the world. Many were driven out away from their families to find employment, even forced into servitude. You yourself know their heartaches, brought about by children growing up with neither father nor mother. You are intimately acquainted with their plight, their hardship and suffering. Meet our scattered people where they are at. Use their deplorable circumstances to lead them to your Son, who himself is the suffering servant. Heavenly Father, you are the one and only true God of the Philippines. Send us to the nations to spread your saving love and grace. Now, may your spirit of wisdom and understanding, your spirit of counsel and might, your spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord rest upon us, and the Filipinos will delight in the fear of the Lord. Amen. said sometimes he'd get up and start talking before he read his text. He'd go for a while and then he'd say, well, that's not my sermon. <laughs> said, the Lord told him one time, if I say it's your sermon, it's your sermon. Oh, okay, Lord. <laughs> I do think I was supposed to say what I said. I hope he took it to heart. But I would like to share a thought with you for just a moment here, if I may. We're going to go to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 6. And, uh, you know, the Bible is real good about giving us instructions for getting along with one another. I heard somebody who complained lately, I don't have any friends. Well, be friendly. All right. The scripture says, He who would have friends. Must show himself friendly. If you're not friendly with others, that may explain why nobody's friendly with you. So, but here's some advice for family relationships from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee. And thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This is a scriptural principle. Whether we like it or not, God says it's important. Yeah. Honor your father and mother, the first commandment with promise. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth. Some people think they're very clever because they've rebelled against their parents. Remember one situation of a girl who, uh, my mom and dad don't control me. I don't have to do anything they say. I said, oh, okay. And then I watched her life, and every decision she made was based on what her parents would do, and she chose the opposite. You understand? She's being controlled by them. Just doing it the exactly the opposite of what they would do, but still, her decisions were being made by what they chose. It's not good for us to allow ourselves to live in a spirit of rebellion. But this uh, business of honor your father and mother it has some significance that uh, is more than just 
saying, Hi, Mom, I love you. Sometimes we're a little bit like my mother's cousin. Um, when he was five years old, he decided to had it with his family. I'm running away from home. And he told his mom, Mom, I'm leaving. She said, well, son, if you're leaving, let me send you something to eat with you at least. Okay. And she made him a little lunch with a sandwich and a piece of fruit. She wrapped it up in one of her husband's work handkerchiefs and tied it to a stick. And he left home with his lunch over his shoulder. And they watched him as he went out. They kind of hid behind the bush and watched him. He went down to the corner, sat down and ate his lunch. After a little bit, he got up and came back home. Walked through the door, slammed the door open, said, Hi, Mom, I'm back. Wow, I see you still got the same old cat. Well, sometimes our idea of running away from home doesn't work quite like we thought it would. I remember when I was 12 years old and wasn't appreciated near as much as I thought I should have been. <laughs> and I decided to run away from home. I had a bicycle and I figured I could make it over to a cousin's house. It was about 30 miles away. And then I started doing some calculating and how long it would take me to go 30 miles on that bike. Trying to figure out how I would eat in the meantime. And I never could come up with a good solution on how to finance my trip. So I stayed home. <clears throat> but we can allow rebellion to get in our heart. And rebellion is a terrible thing, folks. It never is justified. I don't care what your reasoning is for your rebellion, it is never appropriate. But we live in a culture that is teaching children to disregard and dishonor the teaching of their parents. Because if we can do that, then we can manipulate their mind and perhaps make them think the way we want them to think. And our government schools are full of this, folks, whether you like it or not. My own son, when he was in high school, had a teacher that taught him. Well, you don't have to believe what your parents teach. Just pretend like, don't let them know you don't agree with them. And taught them how to be deceptive with their parents. Let me tell you something. Teenagers don't need any help to learn how to be deceptive. That's a big problem. And teaching them to be rebellious but deceptive about it is harmful to them. But here's something you need to know. When you teach children to rebel against their parents, you are teaching them to rebel against all of us. Children who do not respect their parents will not respect law enforcement or other leaders either. Be advised, it's a principle that God established that the parents are to teach the children and as the children learn to respect the parents then they become respectful human beings. Children who do not respect their parents will live a life where they don't respect authority. And I am afraid that in our culture there has been a lot of contempt for parents. Uh, my wife attended a meeting some years ago where they were talking about a program that uh, she found to be horrible that they were trying to institute. Uh, they would have government workers who had 15 or 20 hours of training come around and tell parents how they're supposed to take care of their kids and if you're not following the advice, then they will report you and maybe your children will be taken away from you. And at a meeting where this was being presented, some representative of the program got up and said, the worst person to be raising our kids is their parents. Oh, really? You think some government bureaucrat with 15 hours training is going to love my child who came from my loins? 
You think that's a possibility? Let me tell you something. Anybody who said that doesn't know what they're talking about. But amazingly, I have discovered over the years, it seems like the folks who have no children have the most advice on how they ought to be raised. <laughs> over in the book of Matthew, it says, the scribes came to Jesus in uh, chapter 15. The scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus and uh, they were saying, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. Well, it's a good idea to wash your hands for you. <laughs> but do you understand that wasn't scripture? It was tradition. And they considered that tradition more that was ultimately important. And Jesus said, why do you transgress the commandment of God with your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother, and he that curses father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whoever shall say to his father or mother, Oh, it's a gift by whatever you might have profited by me. I'm going to give it to the church, so you don't get anything. And honor not his father or mother, he's free from the obligation. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of of men. This morning I'd just like to leave you with this thought. We cannot replace God's way with our new improved process. Amen. David loved the Lord with all his heart. He was a man after God's heart, so much so that the Bible calls him the apple of God's eye. And he wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be in Jerusalem where they were setting up the capital of the country. He said, let's move it over there. And somebody came up with this great idea. We're going to take, we're going to make a special wagon to transport this. We're going to bring it in. We're going to honor it. Oh, it was a big thing. They were celebrating and they were excited and they were bringing the ark and there was a rough spot in the road and the wagon tipped and it looked like the ark was going to fall off and us reach out and touch it to hold it. And he died on the spot. You know, that's a really good way to ruin the party. <laughs> it, it, all the rejoice was over him. I said, they said, stop, stop right here. I said, leave it right there. We're not moving it till we hear from God. God said, I told you how to move the ark. It was supposed to go on the shoulders of the priest. They were supposed to carry it. I didn't ask you to make me a cart. I didn't ask you to come up with a new improved version of what I said to do. I want you to do it the way I said to do it. Yes. Folks, the word of God is adequate the way it is. Some lady was trying to convince someone of a scriptural argument she used the verse and she added a couple words to it to make it sound a little bit more like it. So the person went home and they looked up the verse. And went, Wait a minute, it doesn't say that. <laughs> You're just a fraud. And she, they didn't want to listen to anything she had to say. Somebody asked them, why did you say it that way? There's so many verses to explain what you were trying to say. You didn't have to add to it. She said, well, I thought it needed to be a little stronger. My uncle who was telling me this story said, Morris, remember this. The truth is strong enough on its own. It doesn't need this. And 
more than true is a lie. Less than true is a compromise. Let the truth stand on its own. God doesn't need us to help his scripture out. Some preacher told me when I first started pastoring, said, now Morrison, you have to keep in mind in your training of your young people, you know, if, if you don't want them going to bed with each other, tell them they don't dare to kiss. So well, the Bible doesn't say it's a sin to kiss. Yeah, but if you let them start kissing, next thing you know, they will do the thing that the Bible says, don't do. So you tell them it's a sin to kiss. That sounds a lot like the way Adam taught Eve the word of God. God told Adam, don't eat from that tree in the middle that's called the knowledge of good and evil. Now you can eat from anything else, but leave that one alone. Okay. Now there's no word, no reference in scripture that tells us Eve was ever told by God. But she knew that tree was off limits. Because when the serpent asked her, is, is it true you can't eat from some of the trees? Oh, we can't eat from that one you're in. As a matter of fact, we can't even touch it. God didn't say don't touch it. But Adam decided to make it a little stronger. We must not add to the word of God. Let's take it like he said it. I had a dad who was really strict about quoting scripture the way it says it. And some of you know when I first came here, I came to a system, his health had begun to fail, and I was doing the preaching. Sunday afternoon, we would always go to his house, and mom would make a big meal, and we'd all have dinner together. And then he'd say, Morris, where does the Bible say? And he would call out something that I had said during my preaching. Well, you know, uh, it's kind of like that, isn't it? He said, when you're quoting the Bible, don't give me kind of like it. Give me what it says. I appreciate that. I use the reference. Some of you may have heard people talk about God cast all our sins into the sea of God's forgiveness. You ever heard that line? I like that line. He just took my sins and cast them into the sea of God's forgetfulness. Well, there's a song we call it that way, you know. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me, my sins are gone. So I quoted that song. We got to dinner table. Dan said, Morris, where does the Bible refer to the sea of God's forgetfulness? If you're going to preach it, brother, it better be in the Word. My dad said, I don't want to hear man's traditions. I want you to preach the commandments of the Lord. When I came out of that one, okay, because I said, Dad, look over here. It says in Job, God took all my sins and put them in a bag and cast them into the sea. Paul says, they were cast into the sea, never to be remembered against me again. That means when they're cast in the sea, they're forgotten. That's the sea of God's forgiveness. He said, okay, you got it, son. I'll let you have that one. <laughs> wow, I won one. <laughs> Praise God. But what I'm trying to say to us today, folks, we need to stand on the word. The word is secure. The word is absolute. The word of God is truth. But when we help it out, we don't make it better. It may sound good to you to help it out a little bit, but cut it out. Let the truth stand the way God said it. You think he meant what he said? Yes. You know, sometimes we think, well, maybe God forgot this part. I don't think he did. I think he put in there what he wanted in there. You know, over there in Third John, that little short book of the Bible. Not, it's only one chapter long. It starts off, says, you know, my fervent hope for you is that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Well, that, if that's what the Lord wants for me, sounds pretty good to me. I'll take it, Lord. Somebody said, no, that was just John writing to his 
good friend dies, it's nothing. That's not a promise from God. Oh, really? Let me tell you something. Everything in God's word is for you and for me. Right. If God put it in there, he wanted me to believe it. Can you accept that? And it is his fervent desire that I prosper and be in good health, even as my soul prospers. You know, I need to keep that part in mind. Somebody said, well, that prosper is not about financial prosperity. That's about, you know, prospering spiritually. No. The other part, even as your soul prospers, that's about spiritual prosperity. That first part was about economic prosperity. And he wants me to prosper and be in good health. Do I dare to believe that's what he wants for me? Do I think, do I have to accept, oh, well, maybe God wants me to just spend my life, you know, only firing on two cylinders. The rest of them aren't going to work. No, he wants me to be in good health. I don't need to change it. I don't need to adjust it. If it's in the Word, it's for me. Would you say that with me? If it's in the Word, it's for me. If it's in God's Word, it's for me. And I don't have to fix it up. I don't have to adjust it. I don't need to add to it. I don't need to take away from it. I need to take it just the way God said it and stand on it. Would you stand with me this morning? When we decide, well, yeah, I know that's what God said, but probably he didn't mean that. <laughs> God said it. Take my word for it. He meant it. Amen. And we need to do it. Lord, give us a love for your word. Because your word has the issues of life. And if we will walk by your word, we will walk securely and protected. Lord, teach us, help us, open our eyes, show us, let us see the validity of the power of the word of God, just the way you said it, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Lord bless you folks, it's been good to have you with us, have a great day.